In fairy tales, dreams do come true. Little girls can grow up to marry handsome princes and live happily ever after in beautiful palaces where they have delightful children of their own and in time become queen to rule with wisdom and grace. But in real life, even when it appears a fairy tale is being played out in the full glare of our modern media age, things never seem to go quite to plan. There are few places in the world today where you still find princes and princesses, or for that matter, kings and queens. But the thousands of visitors who travel to London each year come face to face with royal palaces and a history of succession that dates right back to the Dark Ages. However, in the late summer of 1997, people from all over the world gathered in London in a state of utter shock and disbelief as the most publicised fairy tale of the 20th century came to an abrupt and tragic end. In the early hours of Sunday the 31st of August, a shocking news story began to unfold, with the world's press agencies on red alert. Shortly after midnight, Diana, Princess of Wales, left the Ritz Hotel in Paris and got into a waiting Mercedes with her companion Dodie Al Fayed. Speeding off into the night to escape waiting reporters, the car crashed at high speed in the Place de l'Arme road tunnel. The driver and Dodie died instantly, but the emergency services arrived to find Diana alive, although seriously injured. At the nearby Pitti Salpetria Hospital, a team of doctors did all they could, but to no avail, and the princess who should, if fairy tales are to be believed, have lived happily ever after, died at the tragically young age of 36 at 4 a.m. Paris time. The world is shocked to discover this morning that Diana, Princess of As the people of Britain awoke to hear the terrible news in the early morning bulletins, the sense of loss was palpable across the nation. And within hours, floral tributes began to appear at the gates of Kensington Palace, creating a carpet of colour, the like of which had never been seen before. The one question upon everyone's lips was quite simply, how could this have happened? Despite the fact that Diana had been divorced from the Prince of Wales for the past year and had relinquished her HRH status, she was still officially a member of the royal family as the mother of the second and third in line to the throne. For the great British public, Diana was as much England's rose as she had ever been and with her increased charity work, remained one of the most popular of all the royals. Almost instantly the conspiracy theories began to take flight and PR for the House of Windsor hit an all-time low. When the beautiful woman, tipped to lead the royal family into the 21st century, was instead laid to rest in the grounds of her ancestral home, Althorpe, in Northamptonshire. Diana's death without doubt marked the closing of an extraordinary chapter in the history of the royal family. But as the years have passed, rather than fading, her memory has lived on to inspire each new generation. Yet to this day, there are still many questions surrounding the death of Diana, Princess of Wales. And chances are no one will ever know for sure the exact chain of events that led to the moment when Diana's life came to such an untimely end. Even so, nothing can detract from the impact Diana had on those who knew her personally, and the rest of us who watched her progress from afar. And as we remember the princess who meant such a great deal to so many, we'll follow Diana from her birth on the royal estate at Sandringham in Norfolk to catch a glimpse of the real-life daughter, wife, mother and princess upon whom fate bestowed the fame and fortune mere mortals can only dream of, while dealing her the cruelest of blows. When Noel Coward observed, very flat Norfolk, there's no disputing the fact, but to dismiss this ancient county as a result would be to do it a great injustice. With a stunningly beautiful coastline, quaint market towns, richly verdant agricultural land and the navigable rivers and lakes known as the Broads, this is rural England at its loveliest and it is the landscape of Princess Diana's birth and childhood.
Sandringham, where Diana was born, is a popular royal retreat, and as her father, who was destined to become Earl Spencer, was equerry first to King George VI, and then to Diana's future mother-in-law, the Queen, the Spencer family lived at Park House on the magnificent Sandringham estate. Queen Victoria purchased Sandringham Hall, as it was then known, for her oldest son, Bertie, the Prince of Wales, and future King Edward VII, for his new bride, Princess Alexandra. When the renovations were complete in 1870, the house was way ahead of its time, with gas lighting, flushing toilets, and even a very early shower. Today, Sandringham has been the private home of four generations of sovereigns, with the Queen generally in residence over the Christmas holiday until the middle of February. The delightful Church of St Mary Magdalene, where Diana was christened, is the focus of much attention on Christmas morning, as it's where the royal family worship, bringing out quite a crowd to witness the festive occasion. So, when the Honourable Diana Frances Spencer was born at Park House, Sandringham, on the 1st of July 1961, the fourth child of Viscount and Viscountess Althorpe, she could not have had a better placed arrival for a future princess. With two older sisters, Sarah, born in 1955, and Jane, born in 1957, when Diana appeared on the scene, the Althorpes would have still been hankering after a son, an heir, especially as in 1960, their third child, a boy, John, died within hours of his birth. The present Earl Spencer, Charles, Diana's younger brother, was born in 1964 to finally complete the next generation of this aristocratic family. For onlookers, it would appear that Diana was the most fortunate of children, just as she would be perceived as extremely privileged for the entire duration of her tragically short life. But things were never as rosy as they seemed. Despite enjoying the delights of 200,000 acres of beautiful Norfolk countryside, which on occasion meant going to tea with the royal neighbours at the big house, life for the young Spencers was about to be thrown into turmoil. Diana's father was content living as a gentleman farmer and being part of the community, even playing for the local cricket team. But 14 years his junior, her mother, after giving birth to five children before she was 30, longed for the excitement and glamour of London society. Diana was just six when her parents separated, after the Viscountess fell in love with Peter Shan Kidd and left her husband. The acrimonious divorce that followed resulted in custody being granted to the Viscount, and consequently Diana had little contact with her mother. Although close to her father, whom she undoubtedly adored, the day-to-day -day care of the children fell to a succession of nannies, which was far from ideal for the sensitive Diana, who quickly had to learn the art of self-reliance. The older Spencer girls did well at school, but Diana was far more artistic than academic, and she struggled to keep up with the high standards set by Sarah and Jane. Diana's confidence was further dented when she broke her arm in a riding accident, and unlike many of her far from academic peers, she wasn't even to find solace in ponies and horses. After attending Sealfield School in nearby Kings Lynn as a day pupil, Diana followed her sisters to boarding school at the age of nine. A shy girl, Diana was most remembered for her kindness to her fellow pupils, especially those younger than herself, as she grew into her teens. But the Spencer girls faced quite a shock when they returned to Park House for the holidays. In the early 1970s, their father brought the new woman in his life to meet his children, Rain, Countess of Dartmouth, the daughter of romantic novelist Barbara Cartland. If Johnny Spencer had hoped to create a happy new family, he was sadly disappointed, as to say that his children didn't take to Rain as a prospective stepmother would be a colossal understatement. This bombshell for the Spencer children was then followed by yet another dramatic change in 1975 when the seventh Earl Spencer, Diana's grandfather, died at the age of 83. 
Johnny became the eighth Earl Spencer. Charles, his son, was now Viscount Althorpe, and Diana, like her sisters, exchanged her honourable title for that of a lady. The family moved from Sandringham to the ancestral home at Althorpe, complete with 8,500 acres in Northamptonshire. For the painfully shy Diana, away at boarding school for most of the time, it meant she knew no one in the vicinity, and matters got worse a year later when her father married Rain in July 1976. Like many great ancestral estates in the 1970s, Althorpe was in need of total renovation, and the Spencer children believed that Rain was dominating the proceedings, selling off many of the family treasures to fund the refurbishments, which caused considerable resentment. These were crucial years for Diana to be suffering such upheaval, and her schoolwork undoubtedly suffered as a result. When she failed to gain academic qualifications, and a finishing school in Switzerland simply left her homesick and unhappy, she headed for London in search of work. There were plenty of well-to-do young families in London, in search of suitable nannies for their children, and as caring for little ones made Diana happy, which in turn meant she was very good at it, she soon carved out a new existence for herself, although hardly more than a child herself. In 1978, on the advice of her mother, Diana bought a three-bedroomed apartment in Colhern Court, Fulham, and promptly invited a select group of girls who were old friends to house share. These were blissfully happy days for Diana, and although still painfully shy, she started to meet people her own age and enjoy the young, affluent London scene. After a while, she went to work at the Young England Kindergarten in Pimlico, which she described as her first proper job, and again Diana excelled, with her young charges adoring her. At last, the girl who had craved nothing more in her life than approval and affection had found fulfilment, looking after other people's children. The late 1970s and early 1980s were exciting times for this new generation of the aristocracy. Benefiting from family money to back them and a London base for Monday to Friday with a place in the country for weekends, the Henrys and Henriettas of the landed gentry made the Knightsbridge, South Kensington and Chelsea districts of London their own. Here, amongst their own kind, with the system of debutantes out to do the season now defunct, it was possible for these young people to meet suitable marriage partners. And although times were beginning to change, the main goal of an aristocratic girl was still to marry well and produce the next generation of Henrys and Henriettas. This part of London, which incorporated Sloane Street and Sloane Square, resulted in this affluent group being dubbed Sloane Rangers. And to this day, a visit to Knightsbridge or South Kensington will bring you into contact with 21st century Sloane Rangers, keeping up the tradition. That Diana and her flatmates were Sloanes is without question. However, the future Princess of Wales soon developed a style all her own. With a tall willowy grace, the fair complexion of a classic English rose and an endearingly naive and innocent charm, even while still in her teens, this was one lady in waiting who was poised to stand out from the crowd. When Diana was born, her future husband was just a matter of months away from becoming a teenager, and as we've already established, the pair were destined to move in the same circles. However, if Diana's privileged childhood is considered to have been rather lonely and isolated, the early life of Prince Charles can only be sympathetically regarded in the same light. On the 14th of November 1948, a baby boy was born at Buckingham Palace to the then Princess Elizabeth, Duchess of Edinburgh, and her husband, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. Christened Charles, Philip, Arthur, George, the Prince was their first child, 
and had the succession run unhindered after the death of King George V in 1936, the solemn prospect of becoming a king may never have fallen upon the child's shoulders. By right, the first son of King George V, Edward VIII, should have remained on the British throne until his death in 1972. But his determination to marry the divorcee Wallace Simpson, the woman he loved, resulted in his abdication on the 10th of December 1936, after not quite 12 months as the reigning monarch. As a consequence, the next in line, George V's second son, the Duke of York, stepped unexpectedly into the limelight to become King George VI. With Queen Elizabeth, his wife, and two young daughters at his side, despite his shyness and a nervous stammer, George VI became a much-loved and respected sovereign. In a difficult age, as Britain faced the horrors of World War II, the King shared the experience of his people as London burned and even worked with determination to overcome his stammer in order to boost public morale. On the balcony of Buckingham Palace, he celebrated VE Day with all of London in 1945, and in the post-war era continued to restore the reputation of the monarchy after the constitutional crisis brought about by his brother's abdication. That George VI rose to the challenges that fate had thrust upon him is without question, but it wasn't only his personal circumstances that changed. Elizabeth, his eldest daughter, also faced the same constitutional duties as of her father, but as the heiress presumptive was given more time than George VI to prepare for the royal role of sovereign. On her 21st birthday, she declared that her whole life would be devoted to the service of her people, and it was a promise that the young princess took very seriously indeed. When Princess Elizabeth married Prince Philip, a member of the Greek royal family and a second cousin once removed, it was exactly as protocol would have dictated, although it's been suggested that the princess fell in love with her handsome prince while still a girl in her teens. After the arrival of Charles in 1948, Princess Anne was born in 1950 and despite the expectation that Charles would one day become king, it was still a long way off. Nevertheless, when his grandfather's health began to falter in 1951, his mother's accession to the throne was becoming more imminent than anyone realised. George VI died at Sandringham House on the 6th of February 1952 at the age of 56, and a few months shy of her 26th birthday, the new Queen, Elizabeth II, was called upon to do her constitutional duty at a time of great personal loss, still grieving for her father. So it was that His Royal Highness Prince Charles, aged just three, became Duke of Cornwall, Duke of Rothesay, Earl of Carrick and Baron Renfrew, Lord of the Isles, Prince and Great Steward of Scotland, and if that wasn't enough for a toddler to cope with, 
he also became the heir apparent. Now, should you be wondering what the difference is between an heir apparent and an heir presumptive, it's actually quite simple. Prince Charles as heir apparent cannot be removed from his position as first in line to the throne. Technically, when George VI became king, if he had gone on to produce a male heir, his eldest daughter, now Queen Elizabeth II, as heiress presumptive, would have had to have given precedence to a younger sibling because he was a boy. With his mother now occupied with matters of state and his father often away for significant periods of time because of his naval duties, just had been the case for Diana, the day-to-day -day care of Charles fell to nannies and other members of the royal family, most notably his beloved grandmother, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. His circumstances were very different to Diana's, but the need for parental attention, approval and affection would have been just the same, no matter how grand the palaces were that he happened to be living in. It's been said on numerous occasions throughout history that with great wealth and power comes great responsibility. The ancient tradition of noblesse oblige and for Charles, service, duty and the path to kingship probably dominated his childhood and for that matter his entire adult life. Charles was created Prince of Wales in 1958. In keeping with the historic precedent of the reigning monarch, bestowing the title upon the heir apparent since Edward I did, way back in 1301. Ironically, through the pages of the history books, the title of Prince of Wales does not guarantee accession to the throne, and since the first investiture of Edward II, seven have so far failed to go on to become king. Also, the high-profile role of the Princess of Wales, the wife of Prince, has been graced by a number of fascinating women, not least Diana, Princess of Wales, the most famous of them all. Breaking with the tradition of future monarchs being educated in isolation by tutors, Prince Charles was sent to school from the age of eight, firstly in London, then Kent and Scotland. Equally as sensitive as Diana was, Charles is reported to have found boarding at Gordonston School in Scotland difficult miles from home in austere surroundings, where his father, the Duke of Edinburgh, had thrived. Charles completed his education at Gordonston, including two terms at Geelong Grammar School in Australia, leaving with good qualifications, including A-levels in history and French. Rather than going straight into the military, as was traditional for the heir apparent, Charles went to Trinity College, Cambridge, as an undergraduate, reading anthropology, archaeology and history. When he graduated with a BA in 1970, he actually made history as the first member of the royal family to earn a degree. Now considered the most eligible young man in Britain, if not perhaps the whole world, public and therefore press interest was already fueling speculation about a suitable match for the prince. In 1969, Charles's investiture as Prince of Wales was held at Carnarvon Castle, another historic first, as the ceremony was actually held in Wales, and as the event was televised, millions tuned in to watch the Queen bestow this honour on her eldest son. It was in the same year that the Queen took the decision to allow the BBC to film a documentary about the personal lives of herself and the royal family including her two younger sons, Prince Andrew and Prince Edward, born in 1960 and 1964. The programme proved very popular with the public and was a dignified response to the growing media demands faced by the monarchy. Nevertheless, it heralded a new and dangerous era that would culminate in the tragic death of Diana, Princess of Wales, before the end of the century.
When Prince Charles embarked upon a naval career in 1971, complete with dashing uniform, press interest in any girl he so much developed a friendship with escalated. As a future king, he would be expected to produce heirs of his own, and the hunt was on for a suitable bride for the sailor prince. On paper, finding such a lady was quite a tall order, especially at a time when young women, whether high-born or commoners, were enjoying greater independence and sexual freedom than ever before. It was required that a prospective Princess of Wales and future Queen should be Protestant, not a divorcee, meet the approval of her future mother-in-law Elizabeth II and ideally be a virgin, with aristocratic connections and no colourful past for the press to delve into. Many of the young ladies with whom Charles had been linked failed to meet these exacting requirements. But interestingly, when he dated Lady Sarah Spencer, Diana's older sister, in the late 1970s, a royal wedding looked to be on the cards. However, despite Lady Sarah's eminent suitability, a marriage proposal was not forthcoming, and the couple parted company. But not before Charles had come into contact with the incredibly shy but blossoming Lady Diana Spencer. History, as they say, was in the making. Ever since the swinging 60s, London had become an exciting, vibrant and fashionable place to be, and as the equally colourful 70s drew to a close, it appeared that Prince Charles was settling rather comfortably into bachelordom. Then a tragedy occurred that quite literally turned his world upside down. When the provisional IRA murdered Earl Mountbatten of Burma in a bomb blast whilst he was out sailing in Donegal Bay on the 27th of August 1979, they committed a terrorist atrocity that not only shocked the world, but also robbed Prince Charles of a much-loved great-uncle, who happened to be, in all probability, the single most significant male in his life. It's been said that the pair referred to each other as honorary grandfather and honorary grandson, and the younger man always listened to what his worldly wise relation had to say. Great Uncle Louis had without doubt lived life to the full, with a glamorous circle of acquaintance, including royalty and the new generation of celebrities from the Hollywood film industry, counting such luminaries as Charlie Chaplin, Douglas Fairbanks, and Mary Pickford amongst his closest friends. Having watched the previous Prince of Wales, Edward VIII, abdicate over a woman, while being no stranger to the gossip columnists himself over the years, he is reputed to have advised Prince Charles to enjoy the bachelor life while he could, and then marry a young, pure, inexperienced girl to ensure the succession. As Prince Charles grieved for Mountbatten, he turned to an old friend, Camilla Parker Bowles, for support, facing also the recognition of his own mortality. Naturally, he wanted to honour the Earl's memory, and it appears he was now ready to settle down and find a Princess of Wales to stand beside him, as he prepared to face up to the responsibilities of being heir apparent. With the benefit of hindsight, if he could have married Camilla at that time, then the tragedy of Diana's death could have been averted. But she was already married, and as we already know, even if she had divorced her husband, the threat to the constitutional monarchy, such a relatively short time after the abdication of Edward VIII, would have been disastrous. In 
In such an impossible situation, Camilla, as the prince's friend, joined the search for a suitable bride. As the 70s gave way to the 80s, all eyes turned towards London, and more specifically Colhan Court, home to a group of girls about town, one of whom was, of course, Lady Diana Spencer. At 19, Diana, who had watched the prince from fairly close quarters at Sandringham, was not surprisingly swept off her feet by the attentions of a sophisticated, charming older man. Diana was invited to join the circle of acquaintance she had always been on the edge of, including parties on HMS Britannia, the Royal Yacht, during Cow's Week on the Isle of Wight. Today, this beautiful craft is no longer in service and can be found at Leith, the port of Edinburgh, where it is a very popular attraction. However, even at a distance so many years later, it's easy to see how a tender-hearted young woman with little life experience looking for romance would have fallen in love with the prince who opened up such an exciting and glamorous new world to her. Back in London, a relationship between Charles and Diana flourished with romantic candlelit dinners at Buckingham Palace, supposedly in secret. But it wasn't long before the world's press set up camp outside Colhern Court and the Young England Kindergarten where Diana worked. Lady Diana Spencer was demure and charming despite the harassment, proving herself suitably discreet. And with this test passed, she was whisked off to see how she would cope in Scotland, watching the prince and his friends fishing and shooting, as all the while Diana continued to stake her claim to the title Princess of Wales. Diana was also introduced to the county of Gloucestershire, often dubbed the Royal County because of the number of royals with country residences there. Charles took Diana to visit Highgrove, the country house he bought early in 1980, close to the delightful market town of Tetbury. It was during one of the Gloucestershire weekends that Charles took Diana to meet Camilla and with his friend's approval broached the subject of marriage. The official engagement between Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer was announced by Buckingham Palace on the 24th of February 1981. In the photographs to mark the occasion, the bride-to-be wore a blue outfit from Harrods and it was evident for all to see that she adored her fiancé. It was no longer practical for the future Princess of Wales to flat share in Fulham, and immediately after the engagement was announced, she moved into Clarence House, the home of the Prince's grandmother, the Queen Mother. In the months leading up to the royal wedding in July, Lady Di fever swept the land. As she asked for advice from Vogue, where her sister Jane worked, Diana developed a style that was extremely feminine, with pie-frill collars, pussycat bows and long floral skirts, which the high street fashion stores were quick to emulate. Hairdressers up and down the land were asked to reproduce Diana's long, blonde, flicked fringe, and the demand for nannies who were aristocratic young English girls skyrocketed.
Although royal weddings usually favoured Westminster Abbey, St Paul's Cathedral was the chosen venue, accommodating the unprecedented three and a half thousand guests. It was a fairy tale ending to a modern day love story, and when the newlyweds set off for Broadlands, Hampshire, the home of Earl Mountbatten, for the first night of their honeymoon, before taking a Mediterranean cruise aboard the Royal Yacht Britannia, the whole world wished them well and expected them to live happily ever after. And for a while, the Prince and Princess of Wales looked to have found the love and security they both so desperately needed with each other. If the public at large needed further confirmation, an announcement from Buckingham Palace revealing that the Princess was pregnant three months after returning from honeymoon ensured that the next generation of royals became more popular than ever. When Diana gave birth to a baby boy here at St Mary's Hospital, London, on the 21st of June 1982, no one could have asked more of her, and her son, styled His Royal Highness Prince William of Wales, immediately took his place as second in line to the throne. A further visit to St Mary's for the birth of His Royal Highness Prince Henry of Wales better known to the world as Harry, on the 15th of September 1984, made the future of the constitutional monarchy even more secure. It's been suggested that Prince Charles had hoped for a daughter, but a healthy son, third in line to the throne, was again all anyone could have reasonably asked of the Princess of Wales. That Diana, Princess of Wales, adored her two sons is beyond question. But as she fulfilled her royal duties, whether based at her London home, Kensington Palace, or Highgrove in Gloucestershire, the strain was beginning to show. By the mid-80s, there was already speculation that all was not well behind these fine gates. Between the prince and his fairy tale princess, not helped by the glamorous sense of style Diana developed as she grew into one of the world's most beautiful women. Wherever the Prince and Princess of Wales went, at home or abroad, the crowds who flocked to see them were invariably more interested in what the princess was wearing rather than what the more serious-minded prince had to say. However, Diana paid a high price for her status as a fashion icon, suffering from an eating disorder that was most probably bulimia nervosa. In just a few short years, the beautiful English Rose who had promised to breathe new life into the royal family had been stifled by duty and protocol, and Charles, who had always tried to follow the motto of every Prince of Wales, Ik Dien, meaning I serve, found himself right back where he had started, before Diana had agreed to marry him. What happened next 
is well documented through newspaper and television archives. As Charles once more turned to Camilla Parker Bowles for comfort, and Diana searched for solace in what she thought to be a discreet affair. As head of the royal family, the Queen faced a constitutional crisis every bit as explosive as the abdication of Edward VIII, which resulted in her father becoming king back in the 1930s. Matters deteriorated further, and by 1992, after the breakdown of her daughter Princess Anne's marriage and the separation of her second son, Prince Andrew, from his wife Sarah, Duchess of York, the Queen described this as an annus horribilis, which translates from the Latin as quite simply a horrible year. Added to so much family turmoil, Windsor Castle, the place the Queen regards as her true home, was damaged by fire and before the year was out, the Prince and Princess of Wales had also separated. As the world's press looked on, Diana continued to live at Kensington Palace, enjoying time there with her boys. Charles spent a lot of time at Highgrove in Gloucestershire, where the young princes had plenty of opportunity to make the most of the beautiful countryside while they were with their father. Just as is the case for all families that face a marital split, these were difficult times, and for the Prince and Princess of Wales, struggling to find resolution for the sake of the children, the constant press attention did nothing to make things any easier. However, despite her troubled personal circumstances, Diana continued to work tirelessly for charity, campaigning to improve public perception of AIDS sufferers and highlight the terrible destruction caused by landmines as she fought for a worldwide ban on these cruelly devastating weapons of war. Ironically, this undoubtedly worthy, high-profile stance of the princess caused the royal family some difficulty, especially when Diana hit the headlines as she attempted to carve out a new life for herself. It was now extremely unlikely that Diana could still become queen, but it wasn't conclusively resolved, and the public adoration that she generated continued undiminished and Prince Charles as the nation's future king was forever going to find himself overshadowed by Diana. Eventually, the couple's divorce was finalised in 1996, a year and three days before Diana's death on the streets of Paris. And so we return to where we began this remembrance of Diana with the whole world in shock at the loss of this truly remarkable young woman. On a fine September morning, London basking in early autumn sunlight prepared to bid Diana a final farewell. Her funeral was held at Westminster Abbey at 11am on Saturday the 6th of September 1997. The royal family were all in attendance, alongside the Spencers, led by Diana's younger brother Charles, now the Earl. As was only right and proper, the main focus was to support Diana's two sons, William and Harry. So despite conspiracy theories abounding and an element of antagonism levelled at both the press and the royal family, the funeral of Diana, Princess of Wales, was as dignified as it was moving. After the service, watched by millions around the world, Diana's mortal remains were carried on an incredible journey home to Althorpe in Northamptonshire.
All the way from London's familiar landmarks, northwards, the funeral cortege was greeted by literally thousands of ordinary folk waiting to pay their last respects to the people's princess. Even along the verges of the M1 motorway, entire families joined together to say their fond farewells. And by the time Diana eventually reached the gates of Althorpe for the last time, the cortege was more than an hour late. Understandably, Diana's family wanted to bury her where she could no longer be subject to press intrusion, and her grave couldn't be more private on an island in the middle of the Oval Lake in the grounds of Walthorpe. In the years since, those closest to Diana have been able to visit her grave in absolute privacy, which as her sons face the full glare of publicity that dominated Diana's adult life, no doubt they have very much appreciated this. Nevertheless, it has been difficult for the millions of people who would have also liked to commemorate the anniversaries of Diana's life and death, with nowhere specific to gather. The gates at Kensington Palace, where so many floral tributes appeared way back in 1997, will often be where people choose to place flowers. But a memorial in one of the great churches like Westminster Abbey, where her funeral took place, or St Paul's Cathedral, where she married, would certainly prove popular with visitors who wish to remember Diana with thoughtful contemplation. And as her memory lives on, who can say what the future might bring? However, for many people, a tour around the country to quietly walk in the footsteps of this unforgettable princess will always be a very special and rewarding experience. From the magnificent Sandringham Estate in Norfolk to the beautiful Althorpe House in Northamptonshire, these great stately homes so much a part of the nation's heritage have times when they are open to the public. Also, a visit to Gloucestershire will prove very interesting. Despite Highgrove, the home of Prince Charles, not being open to the public, the delightful neighbouring market town of Tetbury is fascinating, especially when you count up the number of by royal appointment signs over the shops. And of course, those of us with an interest in Diana enjoy following the progress of her two sons, Prince William and Prince Harry. So what could be nicer than savouring a pint of finest English ale where the princes have been known to partake of the hospitality when they're staying at Highgrove? Everywhere Diana went, she touched the lives of those she came into contact with bringing joy and hope to where it was most needed. But if you really want to experience the true spirit of this elusive butterfly, then London is the place to go. Beginning with Buckingham Palace, you can walk down the mile following the route Diana took to St Paul's Cathedral on that eventful July morning, leaving the palace as Lady Diana Spencer to return as the Princess of Wales and future Queen. As a point of interest, the Spencer family name is attached to the magnificent Spencer House, which offers guided tours on the Sundays it's open to the public. When the first Earl Spencer was a prominent society figure back in the 18th century, this neoclassical treasure put him at the heart of London, literally just across Green Park from Buckingham Palace. Although hundreds of years later, Lady Diana Spencer lived in a modern flat very different to the grand facade you see before you. Spencer House is nonetheless a timely reminder of Diana's impeccable ancestry in her own right. By contrast, a trip to Colhoun Court will always raise a smile, remembering the vibrancy of Diana as a blossoming bright bee courted by her fairy tale prince.
and naturally a visit to Harrods is an absolute must. Here you will find the stylish designers that Diana adored as a girl about town, but much, much more. There is a permanent memorial to Diana, Princess of Wales, and Dodie al Fayed, put in place by the historic store's owner, Mohammed al Fayed, the father of Diana's companion who died with her on that fateful night in Paris. The official Princess of Wales Memorial Fountain in Hyde Park was opened by the Queen in 2004 to symbolise Diana's great affinity and openness with people from all walks of life. However, the fountain has not been without its critics and many feel a memorial close to Diana's Kensington Palace home far more appropriate. Kensington Gardens have always been associated with Peter Pan, as it's where the author J. M. Barry met the little boys who inspired him to write his masterpiece. Here, the Diana, Princess of Wales Memorial Playground recreates the world of Peter Pan and is a fitting tribute to a princess who had such a special way with children. As our programme draws to a close, this is perhaps the perfect place to remember Diana, Princess of Wales. For an all too short period of history, she lit up the world and shone so bright that her legacy, as you've seen for yourself, lives on. And perhaps the most precious gift bequeathed by Diana to the nation are her sons, Prince William and Prince Harry. Diana's determination to help them lead happy, fulfilled lives knowing that their parents loved them, is a lasting testament to an English rose that will blossom eternally. Yet the story of Diana, Princess of Wales, only goes to show that there's no predicting what the future might hold for any of us. And although we will always feel sadness for a life lost so tragically young, Diana will forever be remembered, where it matters most, in the hearts of those for whom she would have been proud to be Queen. <laughs>